Ladies and gentlemen, it is your favorite night of the week. Welcome back to another episode of the D2 Nation podcast. I am your co-host, Wayne Cavati, and joining me, as always, is the great Bethany Bowman. Welcome back, partner. Good to be back. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I'll forgive you for scheduling a podcast on the national championship night. I've got to watch the <laughs> Hawks here in a little bit. So uh, let's make this quick, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's D1. It's D1. We're all about the D2 nation here. Uh, good, Wayne. Good. <laughs> with just about a month left of the D2 baseball season, we're going to stick with the winning formula that we've had on the show. Last week, we had the red hot North Greenville Crusaders on the show. And this week, we have another scorching hot team from Bethany's neck of the woods. Yeah, well, if we're going to do this, I'm excited we have the Mules on tonight. So joining us today after completing a perfect 15-0 march from the Central Missouri Mules head coach Kyle Crooks and infielder Harrison Schnurbush. Welcome to the nation, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So we like to make it easy and start <laughs> at a good place, and that is the beginning. So we like to let our listeners know how we got to Central Missouri before we start talking about you know, uh, mules baseball, which I, I don't know if you notice, I'm sure you like the little uh, background decoration we have here. <laughs> um, Harrison, we'll start with you. What brought you to central Missouri? Uh, you know, it was a pretty simple decision, honestly. Um, both my parents went to UCM in the eighties. Uh, my dad played ball for the mules. And then my older brother, Jackson also played baseball for coach Crooks uh, at central Missouri. So it really wasn't a hard decision for me at all, honestly. I was uh, pretty aware of the tradition and the, the great success that the program had had in the past, and it wasn't hard. Yeah, and did what did your dad play? He was a shortstop also. Ah, so it run, you didn't have a choice, right? You're a shortstop. No, you're I just, <laughs> from ever since I was little, me and my brother, we've been infielders and nothing else. <laughs> works out go it works out well uh coach to you if i recall your playing days were at the juco and the d3 level so how did you wind up at central missouri yeah um playing days like you said mentioned you know um california and louisiana and um and then ending up here honestly you know just by by being around good people um got an opportunity you know to after graduating from centenary uh, to be a graduate assistant for one of John Cohen's teams at Northwestern state. Um, and, um, and, you know, in a, a random and random chance uh, phone call and meeting with a, with a guy named Andy Sawyers, who's now the head coach of SEMO, but was a head had gotten in kind of a weird twist of events that always happens with coaching had gotten the head coaching job at Hutchinson community college in Kansas. Um, the only thing I ever knew about Hutch was my college roommate at Centenary had gone there. So I thought I'd give it, give it a rip uh, and uh, see if the coaching thing was what I wanted to do. And I ended up spending 12 years in Kansas coaching junior college baseball. Um, had sent players to Central Missouri, Emporia State, Pitts, you know, a bunch of the places, a bunch of the schools in the MIAA at the Division II level. And, um, you know, it had recently had sent quite a few guys to, to Central Missouri and got a call out of the blue one day in the summer from – head coach Tommy Myers and asked me if I'd be interested in, in coaching at that level. Uh, and I grabbed my, you know, my family and, and we packed up and we took a look, look at the place, look at the university and um, had a couple of players that were there currently and also helping me graduate assistants. And it just, just felt like the right thing to do. Um, so we, we moved everything and came up to Warrensburg. The Mules have had quite a bit of success here lately in the past five full seasons, three trips to carry. That is really impressive, pretty insane when you think about it. But this team looks a little bit different. So, Coach, we'll start with you this time. What were your thoughts and expectations heading into this season? Uh, you know, I'll be honest, I, I was really excited. Um, I think a lot of my exit meetings had, you know, the, the, the basic tone of it was, you know, there, we knew about a lot of the guys – that we had in our, in our uniform already that just hadn't gotten an opportunity to perform, you know, with the carryover of some of the old roster. Um, and certainly we knew about Harrison, knew about Donovan and Colin Jones, but there were some other guys that hadn't gotten an opportunity to perform that had been diligently working, waiting, being good people, being good, you know, supporting members and uh, of the team. And, and as a coaching staff, we were pretty excited about the opportunity for those guys to, to play on, on a daily basis. Um, and then, 
we as coaches are always excited to try to grow, you know, the young people. And we didn't know exactly what the young was going to be able to provide in terms of guys that hadn't arrived on campus yet. But um, we were, you know, certainly I think everybody when they start the fall is, is hopeful uh, and, and encouraged and excited about what, you know, what their recruiting classes are. And, um, you know, with some of the leadership that we have from the guys that have been around and, and what the, the new guys, you know, have, have been able to latch on to. It was just, it was really excitement. Um, you know, we, we knew what we lost. We knew what we walked out, what walked out the door and, um, you know, but that, that, that happens. And, and, you know, what we're, what we're happy with is what we had already. And we just knew that, you know, we would, we knew what it was, but not a whole lot of other people did. And Harrison to follow up, how do you think that this team has been able to adapt so quickly and been playing at an, an elite level, even after losing several key pieces? Yeah. Crook said it pretty well. Um, we had some guys who I don't want to say got stuck, but just, you know, if you were an outfielder the last four years, you probably weren't going to play over Eric Webb. So we, just, we had some guys who just, you know, we knew they've been in the program for so long. So John, Par uh, John Prudhomme is a great example. He's playing first for us now, hasn't really got that much of an opportunity to play the last four years, and now he's a double-digit home run guy. Uh, we used to joke around about it all the time last year because we would scrimmage during the weeks, and it would be a red team versus black team. Well, Crooks like to load up the black team and then kind of put the secondary guys on the red team. Get out of here. <laughs> and so, well, our red team was still really, really good, and we used to joke they about it all won. the time. What's that? They always won. Yeah, always we won always the red team. So the red team, we would joke about it. The red team would probably finish second in the MIAA behind the black team. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of that this year. But Crooks also mentioned some of the young guys, you know, you don't know what it's going to be in the fall. Um, we've had some young guys really step up for us and be really big pieces. Chase Heath, one of our catchers. Um, Jacob Steele is a really talented infielder. And then Connor Wolf on the mound. We just have some really young, really good young guys who are going to be big pieces for us in the future too. Yeah, yeah. And, and and Bethany, you may not know and our listeners don't know, but I, I and Coach Crooks can attest to this. I start bothering coaches uh, about D2 baseball about September or October. And I, when I reached out to Coach Crooks this year, I remember you talked about that. That's the steep learning curve, but you knew the talent was there. And it was just a matter of, you know, waiting to see how that talent clicked on, on the ball field. Um Somewhere you needed to be strong um, was on the bump and you had those arms, but you did lose Mason Green, who, if I remember correctly, didn't lose a single game in all those years on the mound for you guys. What coach to you, what, what have you seen on the mound this year that's been working so well? Honestly, this, you know, if there was ever a year to recognize a pitching coach, this would probably be it. Uh, coach Westfall has done a lot, a lot with, you know, I would say, obviously a different group, you know, the best, probably the, the, the best thing, the best place to start is, is you bring back Colin Jones, um, who's just an ultimate competitor has been through um, every situation, the MIAA and, and D2 baseball, I think can give to you. Um, so that helps, you know, you've got a stalwart, a foundation, um, you know, a worker that, that you can point to and say, this is how it's done, you know, follow in his footsteps. Um and he cares about the group and cares about the uniform and, and wants to help people do so. And then the rest of it, I think, has been um, piecing a lot of it together. Um, you know, there, there were a whole lot of people to get to know. Um, and there is, you know, certainly a, a way we, you know, I, every coach and, and team likes to do things. And there was, you know, as, as you said, a, a learning curve there that, that we needed to, and we're still, we're still going through. Um, and Coach Westfall has really found a, a way of, of managing you know, how, you know, who we're going to start, how we're going to use the bullpen. And it's been a little bit Tampa Ray ish, you know, if, you know, I think, I think yesterday, you know, we, our, our starter gave us an inning or two. Um, and then we went from there with the bullpen and the bullpen did a tremendous job. And, um, you know, but in, in contrast on Friday, Colin went six. So it, you know, he's, he's really had to, to find, to find, not find roles because there's been plenty of them, but feel put, put people in the best place where they can have success. And um, you know, that's, that's been what it's been. I think that's what he's really good at uh, while developing these young guys, you know, while getting them acclimated to this level of competition, you know, Harrison mentioned Connor Wolf, Connor Wolf's never had to throw a slider in high school because in Tipton, they weren't, you know, it just wasn't a thing. You could just, you could just blow everybody away with the fastball. And um, you know, he's, he's got to learn how to pitch now. He got a little bit of that, uh, you know, on Saturday and, uh, the fastball wasn't quite enough to beat the bats that he was facing. So he had, you know, he had to pitch a little bit different. Um, 
So I, I think, you know, the coaching staff's really just had to, to find different ways. As you mentioned, we had Mason before, you know, we had guys like Luke Lucas before we've had some people that you could count on that were going to go, you know, go out and take the ball and give you four five, six good innings. And, and we've had to piece it together a little bit differently and reimagine the way we do our pitching a little bit this year. And, you know, it, it's, it's still a work in progress. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Harrison, we like to geek out on hitting and pitching mechanics on this show. So take us through and at bat and discuss your approach at the plate. And like you mentioned, other guys doing great things as well oh, on with double digit home runs and, and ditto. So what's the mentality of a mule at bat? Yeah, so it's going to vary a lot, really. Um, Should two it? Things. Well, <laughs> it can. It depends, honestly, if there's runners on base or if you have something to do in the box. You know, if there's a runner on third, your approach is going to be very different than if there's two outs and nobody on base. So for me, I try to keep it as simple as I can. Make a pitcher, two-pitch pitcher, his two best pitches. Go from there and uh, get the foot up early, see the fastball, and hit it. It's been working, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Bethany mentioned it earlier, this team has had for years sustained success, right? And, and sometimes I wonder if people really realize how hard it is to do what Central Missouri has done, right? There's 300 teams in D2 baseball. And for three of the past five years, you've been amongst the final eight and twice amongst the final four, right? So when you do that and you're coming out of the Central region, then you look at it and it's been Central Missouri in the championship game last year, Central Missouri in the semifinals the year before, Augustana won in 2018. So three years in a row, pretty solid representation from that central region. Coach, to you, let's talk a little bit about that region and what you think it's going to take to get back to carry for yet another year. Well, I, I think we got an early taste of it in facing Augie down in Houston. Um, and, uh, you know, we were on the bad side of that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a quality team um, up and down their lineup. They present problems in terms of the ability to run. Um, they return, you know, they return a couple of really experienced hitters at the top of the lineup. Um, they rolled out some arms that were pretty darn good. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it uh, was an exciting game. I think, you know, we probably, you know, shot ourselves in the foot or I actually, I'll take full responsibility. I shot us in the foot, at least, at least one inning for a scoring opportunity. And, um, you know, the Augustan is very good. The central region is, you know, I'll start with our conference. I think the MIAA conference uh, I've said it for a long time is like the SEC of division two baseball. And, and I'm sure I know there are good conferences, you know, I, I know there are, um, but I believe in, in, in this one for sure a week in and week out. If, if you don't play well, um, if you don't bring all three parts of the game, pitching, defense, and hitting, you're not just going to get beat. You're going to get embarrassed. Um, and so this league really forces you to, to be strong in, in those, three, those three aspects of the game right away. Um, and that, I think, helps prepare for central region play. But then, you know, again, as the Augustanas of the world, the Southern Arkansas of the world um, are extremely strong teams. They return a lot of guys. They were a very good team last year. Um, and, uh, you know, and then in our league, I think Pitt State, Missouri Southern, uh, UCO, I, we just got done playing Washburn. That's a quality team, a really quality team. Um, and, you know, in terms of going down to the GAC, you know, we, we got a chance to play uh, Monticello, physical, well-coached team. John Harvey does a really good job. Got a series canceled against Arkansas Tech, but I feel like, and I haven't, I really don't pay attention once the season starts who's doing what, but I'm assuming Arkansas Tech is doing a, a, a good job. I know through, I think your coverage, the Henderson State was on some ridiculous run at some point in the GAC and we saw them in the region tournament too. And I think Mason had to be at his best for us to beat them in two, one game. If I'm not, if I remember right, or one, nothing game, something like that. Harrison remembers that game. That was special. We did something that's never been done before. Um, and, uh, you know, it, that the central region, you know, I, we, when Augie won it in 2018, we had to play against them and, and it was, it was a tight game. That was a really, really good team. And then we were at Southern Arc and we ended up losing out in the semifinal to Southern Arc. And, you know, those teams are back again and, and continue to load up with power pitching, um, you know, athleticism across the board. And, um, you know, the coaching staffs do a great job. And, it's, you know, it's no coincidence that, um, you know, those guys are there continuing, you know, to man the ship and, and bring in great players and, and teach them how to play good baseball. 
Yeah, you mentioned that MIAA. We should point out, uh, you mentioned Pitt State. Uh, Coach Fernelli this past weekend joined the Thousand Win Club. That's when yeah. I, was, I did an article on it, obviously. He's only the sixth coach to do so. And, and when you think about that, that, it's just a remarkable feat. At any at any level, six coach to do that? No, no, D, D2. Oh, D2. D2, gotcha. Yeah, but it's not many. It's not much more. It's not much more that have done it at all levels. But it. So yeah, it was a pretty pretty cool feat to see that happen. No question. And Bob's been doing it really well for a long time. Um, you know, at uh, there's no you know doubt, and he's he's got another good team this year too. Um, you know, from, gosh, I think you know he kind of followed a similar route. I think he went from Butler Community College and then went to Hayes and then Emporia and then where he's at now. So. Yeah, he's, you know, it is an incredible feat. I'm glad you covered it. I think that speaks a lot to the, to the league. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to watch you guys play a lot of baseball. Um, Coach, it just seems like, you know, you've done an incredible job creating an awesome culture there. Harrison seems like you guys all really love being mules. And uh, they also all point out have some awesome, really fire uniforms. So, um Guys, you're doing a great job there. Besides all that stuff and, and the nice facilities you've got, what makes D2 special for you guys? Go ahead, Harry. Uh, you know, D2, it's a little different from Division One in terms of people like me, really. I didn't have crazy abilities in high school. Was, I wouldn't call it a late bloomer, but those guys have a better shot at Division Two. Um, you can make an impact right away, chance of playing. Uh, the campus is awesome. The university is amazing. You know, class sizes are smaller than most division ones. And that's a big thing for some people for the, for some academics. Um, there's a lot of really, really good baseball in division two that I don't think a lot of people understand. If you were to watch our game yesterday, Washburn's rolling out 90 mile an hour arms. Um, our reliever, Josh Borkas, was throwing 96 and spinning sliders at 2,900 RPMs. So there's a lot of really good baseball in Division Two. Coach, how about you? Uh, you know, I think, I think Division Two is a sweet spot of baseball. Um, and I love to see the growth of college baseball. I think it's the best brand of baseball there is anymore. Um, at, at any level, professional included, and not to say that our athletes necessarily are as capable, but I think, I think the game as it's played and as it's romanticized and as I know it to be, it's still allowed to be that. Um, the the kids are there as as student athletes, and they're demanded to do both. Um, and there's there's no um, I guess there's no there's no mincing that or leaving one on the table for the other. Um, there's professional baseball ability. You've seen it, you know, year in and year out, multitude of different teams. Uh, and I think the quality of the games that are played is still, um, I, I guess, to me, still has what's at the heart of competition in, in mind. And that's a group of people trying to achieve something together. Um, and uh, that that to me, you know, along with the class size, um, along with the, uh, sorry, it's my son. Hello. Um, it, uh, that's Bethany and that's Wayne. They're covering our team being very nice about it. Um, I think there's just, there's just a lot of special unique things that allow this to be at the heart of what I think based collegiate athletics should be. Um, they, you know, our guys got to shovel snow as I'm sure other people do it, at, you know, at our level. Um, and they're, you know, they do it and they know they got to do it and it's a chore, but it's also something they can enjoy doing and take pride in doing. And, um, you know, there, there are things about what they do that they're, they're still earning what every single thing they get and fighting for everything they get. And, um, and those things I think are what a lot of our jobs are to do is continue to grow these people into better men. And, and I think it allows us to do it at this level. Yeah, it's funny you said that, Bethany. Remember, we had uh, Colorado Mesa on earlier in the year, and Hayden McGeary, a two-time player of the year, was talking about how he still has to shovel snow. So it, it doesn't matter who you are. That's your job. You're not exempt from it at this level. No, no question. And, you know, and, and the beauty of it is, is, you know, Harry mentioned some, you know, I think what are insane numbers. You know, we, you know, you're talking, I don't, I mean, I don't know how long you've been doing this, Wayne, but, you know, as long as I've been doing it, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, when you saw somebody throwing 90, that was a, a big deal. It was 89, 91. This guy's just doing unreal things. He's Harrison's talking about a reliever going 91 to 96 with 21, 2,900 RPMs on the slider. And, you know, that's our level of baseball. It's a pretty high quality game. And, and there is very, very little involvement of advisors and 
some of the other things that I believe muddy up the waters and make it tougher on kids it's to just go compete and do what they're supposed to do and go to class and, uh, and be good people and be good sons and brothers. And, um, you know, so I, I just think it's a, it's a really sweet spot in terms of level that, that allows us to have all of those things. Yeah. Well, you definitely know, I'll agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I definitely agree with you that the, it's amazing how the players are getting better and they've already been good in the first place. So it's been fun to watch that. Yeah. Um, but okay. But gentlemen, you made it through the easy part of the show, and we're going to close up with the D2 Nation hot seat. Are you both ready? Do it. All right, All right Bethany. Okay. We'll start easy. Harrison, this is for you first. What is your favorite baseball team and player? St. Louis Cardinals, Matt Carpenter, who's now with the Rangers. <laughs> and Coach, for you, just a little bit different, uh, who is a baseball manager or coach that you've admired over the years, and who is your favorite team? Wow. Um, manager of mine over the years, Tori. Um, I think he did a great job of managing expectations and, and, um, and, and egos and personalities at the, at the professional level. Um, and then uh, what was the second part of it? Uh, just who's your favorite team? Oh, the Yankees. Easy. Yeah! <laughs> That's okay. I'm a Yankees fan. I'll take any extra cheers Yankees, over there. Too. Your son's favorite team. There was, there was, what's that? Who's your son's oh. favorite team? He has no choice. No, it's the Yankees, absolutely. Yeah, there you have it. <laughs> right. Um, all right, it gets a little tougher here. Uh, Harrison, to you first. What's the best baseball movie of all time? Moneyball. Nice. Coach? I echo his sentiments. Ah. Well, you did say the romanticized baseball, and that's, that's that famous line from that movie, so there you go. <laughs> yep. Okay, if you had to pick the pregame warm-up mix, uh, what are you picking, Harrison? So we have a playlist. I usually put out a, a piece of paper before every season and everybody just throws in a mix of whatever. But if it was just me, it would be Bad Bunny Radio. What's your walk-up song? This year it is Return of the Mac by Mark Morrison. Great one. Great one. Um, and Coach, for you, if you had the choice for what's being played over the speakers before the game, what would you pick? So... My my choice is Metallica, um, the old version, the older stuff, not the newer. But I will say I've I've been affected in a lot of ways by our players, but that's one. I Harrison has done it to me, and I'm a big fan of reggaeton. I, Bad Bunny Radio is okay with me. I think in and of itself it makes our infielders better. Um, but uh, but I'm gonna go with Metallica by by far and away. They they lead the pack there. I like it with with the hair Metallica. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> um harrison what's your favorite food i eat chipotle three four days a week <laughs> coach how about you uh any smoked meat is what i'm is what i'm good with that works okay what's your go-to binge worthy netflix or television show harrison first i just did yellowstone that was incredible and then uh ted lasso over the summer was also really good uh Harrison we kid you not at least one person on every show we've ever had has binged Yellowstone and I still have not gotten to watch it I have to watch the show you, you do have to it is yeah. unbelievable yeah and coach same wow um yeah I mean both I've only seen season one of Ted Lasso but I was hooked right away that's probably the only show that I've truly binged I don't know what the I don't know what the definition of a binge is, but it was it was hours. multiple episodes on a single day. Um, Yellowstone, I watched religiously, but it was week to week to week. Um, no binging. And then uh, I'm still a fan of Ozark. Uh, so I am I'm anxiously awaiting the second part of the final season. But you say Cobra Kai. No. I like Cobra. I binged Cobra Kai. That's okay. That, I did too. I went all four seasons in a row. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> I haven't done it. <laughs> uh, all right. So the last question, here we go. It's a little, it's similar, but it's going to be a little different for each of you. Harrison, tell us a secret talent outside of baseball that people may not know you have. Oh man. <laughs> I don't know if I have any. Um, Stop. What do you, what do I have, Crooksy? You know what your language skills are. Okay. Well, I speak a little bit of Spanish, but I wouldn't say it's a secret talent. 
I don't know um, how many people know outside of nobody knows because you don't speak it anymore. Yeah, I well, we lost Enrique Madera last year. He was my only Spanish speaking partner. So, like not how well, Harrison? Uh, it's conversational, read and write fluently. Okay. That's, pretty, think that's better than I can do. He can handle himself in a, in a foreign country just fine and be all right. Um, so, Coach, to, to you, if you weren't a baseball coach, what would you be doing? I, I've been asked this before, and I'm embarrassed to say I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly if I'm built for anything else. But I got my degree in history, and I, I think if I had educated myself properly and done the work on the front end, I think I would be a lawyer. But I'm not positive. Um, that's, that's where I think I would go. That's, that's, you know, if I'd have, if I'd have done it right and taken the LSAT and all those things, I can argue with the best of them. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it comes in handy when, uh, and that makes a bad call, you know, you use the, the argumentative skills a little bit. So what's interesting is, is I rarely argue with umpires, yeah, but I've got players present company included <laughs> that I'm happy to get into discussions with. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right. Well, we, we, you made it through the hot seat, which is good, and we appreciate that. So we want to thank you for joining us. Uh, let you go get some rest. We know we get, you got to get back to work this week, and uh, we wish you good luck the rest of the way. Appreciate you guys so much for doing this and covering Division II baseball. Uh, means the world. So thanks so much for you guys and your time. Yeah, absolutely. We thank you. And remember, D2 Nation, before we go, we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and anywhere you want to listen to a podcast. Give us a follow, follow us on Twitter, and we'll see you next week on the D2 Nation.